So obviously, like we talked about, I've known Jessica for years, but only really known her as a quilter. And I knew that she was a cop, but I had no idea anything else. And all I have to say is she is freaking amazing. <laughs> Welcome to episode 10 of the Unalike podcast. We have so many good stories to share today, starting with the lady who made an interesting observation when she joined her child at school for lunch, and the man working at the sporting goods counter who also made an interesting observation. We're going to talk about National First Responders Day, and later in the show, we're going to catch up with a first responder who is paying it forward in a big way. But first, Natalia, how are you doing? Welcome back. We've all been out for fall break. I am so good. Thank you for asking, Chrishell. It Fall break, crazy. We had a fun little vacation. I haven't actually taken a vacation with my family where I completely disconnected from the internet in probably like 13 years. So for me, this little vacation was amazing. <laughs> It was about, like a real vacation. It was. It's, you know, everywhere, having a small business everywhere for the last 13 years, I have just carried my phone with me so that I could always check in, check emails, whatever. And this was kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you were able to get away. And I... We're going to talk about that in a minute, about an interesting observation I made while you're away, but also want to point out that our technical director, Brandon, took some time off and he uh, spent some time with his family. He, of course, helps edit and put all of our podcasts together. And, you know, we I have to give him a big shout out because last week we thought that our episode was going to be delayed a little bit. Of course, we caught up with Marie Mooring from the Morning Bunch, Mooring Bunch bunch. And uh, I had to reach out to Marie. Our, our viewers and listeners don't know this, but I had to reach out to her and say, oh, shoot, we realized we've had a little bit of a, um, a scheduling conflict because it's fall break here in Utah. The entire state takes the last couple of days of the week off for uh, for fall break. And and so for, the, for you and me and Brandon, that put a, a glitch in our recording process. But yeah. anyway, so long story short, Brandon reached out and said, Hey, I'm all done. I've, I've, I brought my equipment with me and set up a pseudo recording studio here in my vacation place. So he was <laughs> editing while he was on vacation and put together that fantastic episode. It was awesome and inspiring. And she makes me want to, I have no rhythm, but she makes me want to dance. <laughs> well, uh, that's what I said. I dare you to watch that and not get up out of your seat and try to start doing some of those moves, especially for those of us who remember those old school moves. And I don't like or appreciate that she called them old school because those were all cool when we were in school. Hey, but they are cool and old school is cool. <laughs> I, I, she's got a great cause, a fantastic platform, and I like what she is doing to bring yeah. back clean dancing and and to show off so many of those dances that have been popular for many years. Yeah, totally, totally agree. So did you do anything fun for fall break? <laughs> you know, I so I stayed around. I didn't go out of town, but I did take the days off, uh, mostly so that I could spend some time with my kids to focus on them and give them a little bit of attention. But uh, one really neat thing happened, and I want to share this. We just were referencing that you run a small business, and mm -hmm. and you are the everything of the small business. You're the CEO. You're the marketer. You're the executioner, you're the producer, you're the salesperson, you know, all of the above, right? And people know that Brad helps you. But but for those who are a little new to the podcast, I just want to take a minute to really give a shout out to you and everything that you are doing. And, and the fact, as you just alluded to, the fact that you haven't really taken a true vacation for 13 years. And what that mm. means is that even if you walk away from your 
sewing and you're quilting, you've always still got your phone on you and you're still checking emails. You're still looking at orders. You're still responding to social media. You're still posting on social media. And I know that you disconnected this time because you asked me to help out while you were away. Yes. So how was that? How was disconnecting? Um, Honestly, it was amazing. We were camping, so we were in a place where I didn't even have the ability to try to connect. And it's what I needed was to be able to disconnect completely like that. It was so just refreshing. And I came back feeling like, oh my gosh, I can function again. And I've dejunked half of my house since then. And it was really what I needed. But what I do have to say is, my small business is me. It's my quilting. And so even letting go enough, you know, letting go of my control, I guess, and letting you do the socials and check all that for me was a really big step. I kind of feel like a grown up that I <laughs> <laughs> let somebody else do that for me for a minute. Sure, sure, that you could hand over the reins. Well, it, yeah. I, I appreciate it. It was fun for me to help out. I do a little bit of that in my daytime job. So it, that was a natural fit, as you and I have discussed. But something really neat happened. And I want to share this. Uh, <laughs> while going through one of your social feeds, and, and just to give a little bit of context here, you share a lot of tutorials online. And these are demonstration videos that teach people how to quilt. So you uh -huh. had shared one of these videos. It had been posted. I don't remember if I posted or if it was scheduled, but it was already up. And now I, my role was to go through and to look at those comments and to respond on your behalf. And so I came across a comment from a lady named Norma. And I, I want to give a shout out to Norma. And um, I'm going to read her comment, if that's okay. She, she wrote... Thank you so much. You have made a big difference in the lives of so many quilters, especially in these socially confining times. So Natalia, I know that a big part of the quilting demographic is middle-aged women. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that everybody who quilts is middle-aged, but yeah. a large part of the quilting industry is middle-aged women. And if we look at what's going on in the world right now with COVID-19 and the, and the COVID pandemic, that means that middle-aged women are approaching that vulnerable age and, you know, the folks who are being told to take extra precautions to physical distance and to stay away from large crowds, which means spending a lot more time at home. And I think that's what Norma is getting to is that, shoot, I'm a little bit homebound, but because of you, Natalia, you are giving me something to look forward to each day. You're giving me a reason to wake up. You're giving something to do and thank you. So <laughs> I was really struck by that. And, um, you know, I, I was going through the comments and, and saying thank you to several people. They, uh, many people. Um, just tell you how amazing your quilting is. And so I was responding to all of those and saying thank you and thank you. And But this one from Norma really struck me. So I replied and I, I want to read my reply. I said, oh my gosh, thank you so much. At least we have quilting to keep us sane during all the craziness in the world today, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I hoped that that did a good job speaking to her, for, you know, at, on uh, on your behalf. But then Norma replied, and, and so now I. this is what really got me. Norma writes back, and she says, I am grateful for my love of quilting and for all the sharing you do. I lost my husband four years ago. I live in a small town and need to travel over a hundred miles for classes. This definitely helps on those hard days. There is so much comfort in quilting. Hmm. So I want to start today's show off by saying, Natalia, you are making a huge difference in the lives of hundreds, thousands of people across the country, across the world. And I don't think all of our listeners know that. But when I saw what Norma said, I thought that that needed to be shared. Well, first of all, I have to say thank you to you for doing that. And also to Norma and my complete like everybody that has followed me and supported me in this quilting journey. Um, it's something that I started doing really just to, to kind of give me some sanity when I was a young mom and stuck at home, 
I guess I wasn't stuck at home, but I was a young mom with a newborn at home and I just needed an outlet. So I bought this crazy machine and just started quilting. And I started sharing a little bit and blogging and different things like that. And obviously it's grown a lot over the years. And I've mentioned that I spend a lot of years on the road traveling and teaching. I've actually taught in 44 states and even Canada and other places. But teaching in person is one thing. You know, you get that human interaction and you get the touch and the feel of other quilters. And quilters are very tactile. We like to feel fabric. We like to touch and different things like that. So... A couple of years ago, I actually had kind of made this decision to try to transition to working more from home, mainly so that I could be at home with my kids. And they're a really important time in their lives where I didn't want to be on the road. And I, as of 2020, could not be more grateful for that decision that I had spent time preparing so that I could teach online and do all this stuff that I am doing now online. But the downfall with teaching online is you lose that human interaction. And sometimes it's easy to forget that the people on the other side of the camera are people too. And hearing those stories, it makes me like get so emotional that, wow, these people, I'm really making an impact. But hearing those comments back, it makes such a huge impact on me and is the thing that really does keep me going. So Thank you, Norma, and thank you, everybody else who leaves kind comments and is so positive. And, you know, Chriselle and I talked about this over the last couple of days since I've been back home. And one thing we really talked about is the positivity in the quilting community that quilters really do try to uplift each other and inspire each other. And thank you. Thank you to all of you for that. So. Well, I'm not done. I, I have another one for you. Since we're on the topic, <laughs> um, I got a call last night from my mother-in-law, Sherry. Oh, okay. And Sherry has been, well, she's my mother-in-law, so she has to watch, right? She doesn't have a choice. But <laughs> clear back in episode one, we talked about what you did with your great grandma's quilt. Do you oh, yeah. remember this? And for yes. everyone who's been watching, this amazing story about Natalia taking an old tattered quilt, breaking it up into several pieces, and then framing it and mm -hmm. sharing that with family members, cousins, um, mm -hmm. and, and giving everyone a small piece of great grandma's quilt. Yeah. So Sherry watched that. And after episode one, she called me and she was crying and she doesn't know I'm telling this story. So I hope I don't <laughs> spill the beans and, and I hope I don't ruin Christmas because I'm telling you everything. But she called me devastated and she says, Chriselle, I am sick to my stomach because my grandma had a beautiful quilt. I held on to it for years and I don't know what I've done with it. Aww. She said, it's one of those things that you hold on to and you just don't know what to do with it, right? It ends up on the shelf in the back room. And, and that's what she said, that basically she doesn't know where it ended up. And probably the next two or three times I saw her, she kept referring back <laughs> to this story that you and I talked about in episode one and how the idea to break that quilt up and to gift it to family members who would appreciate it was the most fantastic idea ever. But every time she thought about it, it made her more sad because she's thinking, what did I do with my grandma's quilt? Yeah. Last night, completely out of the blue, Sherry called me and said, Chriselle, I found my grandma's quilt. Oh, that's awesome. And you wouldn't awesome. believe where it was. I don't. In a cedar chest is where it would be at my house. <laughs> It wasn't in the cedar chest. No, it was out in the garage and it was, they've got a, an extra car in the garage that doesn't get driven. And so it's, it's parked over in the third bay and oh, yeah. it was, I think in a box, but out there okay. on that third car that doesn't get moved. And she said, I found my grandma's quilt. So oh. 
That's she's awesome. She's now planning to, yeah, to cut it up and to divide it. And that's what she's going to be gifting each of her siblings with for Christmas. Hopefully her siblings don't watch the podcast. <laughs> they can watch after December. Oh, that's funny. That's awesome, but, though. And I'm so glad that she was inspired by that because it wasn't ever anything that I did, you know, intending to inspire other people. It was just a way to try to preserve parts of that quilt. Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic idea. And I think so many people listening probably have felt the same way at one time or another. What do I do with this? Yeah. And so not only is it a brilliant idea, but <laughs> not you, you've you helped Sherry find her quilt, number one. And number two, you've helped her come up with the best Christmas gift ever for each of her siblings. I love it. I love that she's going to do that. That just really made my day. <laughs> So now I can say that I've been doing this quilting stuff for like over 30 years. <laughs> yeah, ab- why not? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I heard that you have a really good story about a lady who decided to join her kid at school for lunch. Yeah. So, okay. I never knew about this thing. You know, I have young kids that are in school and maybe about a year ago, I heard about a mom joining her son at school for lunch. And I didn't know that was a thing. Obviously this year, that probably doesn't happen. But in the past, I guess that was a thing that like on birthdays or special occasions, parents would occasionally stop in and have lunch at school with their kids. So I think that's kind of fun, you know, a way to make your kids feel special if you're able to do that. But I actually came across this short little thing that was shared by Valerie. And it's just so simple, but so to the point. She said, I had lunch with my son at school for his birthday. He can pick two kids to sit with him and one I had never met. I asked him afterwards who he was. And he said, oh, I don't really know him, but no one had ever picked him for birthday lunch before. She says, and just overall, kids are better than we are. And I listened to that or I read that and thought, you know what? Why don't we do that more as adults? When we see that lonely person or we see that, you know, someone that's by themselves or never gets picked, just be their friend. I just wow. love that. Yeah. You know, it, that reminds me, I mean, you say the adults, we, we don't do that. And I, I'll be walking through the hall at work and somebody will pass me and they will say my name. They don't just say hi, but they say hi, Chriselle. And I cannot tell you how many times I've stopped and done a double take because I think to myself, oh my gosh, I didn't know she knows my name. I love that. And I'm sure you feel the same way that I do. Having a name that's a little bit different. When somebody actually knows your name, you're like, Wow, they really do know who I am. It's a pretty cool <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, and you know that they know your name, especially if they pronounce it correctly. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's fantastic. I'm glad you brought that up. But it's something as simple as looking around the lunchroom. And, and as adults, too, we all share workspaces. We all share break rooms. It's easy to look around and say, who's sitting by themselves? Who do I need to say hi to today? Who haven't I caught up with for a few days? Yeah, absolutely. So Natalia, I wanted to ask, I I know that you had heard another story about a little boy who kept visiting a sporting goods store, and I, I wanted to hear more about this. So this is this cool little story that my husband, Brad, actually found on the chive. He loves the chive, so has all sorts of things, but this one just really struck us. So the story goes, this is the third time this year this young gentleman, maybe nine years old, has come into my store. Every time he has been full of yes sirs, no sirs, pleases, and thank yous. He's been wanting to buy a fishing rod and reel. Today he came in with five dollars. His daddy won't let him borrow his rod anymore. Today, because of his extraordinarily good manners and politeness, he left with a $50 fishing rod and reel and his $5. Go fishing, buddy. Be a kid. The man that shared that story, his name was blocked out, but all I have to say is he's an amazing man doing some amazing things in this world. We need more good people like that in the world. I think, you know what? I just want to go out on a limb here and say, I think there are a lot of good people who do good deeds like that, but Absolutely. people are humble, generally speaking. And so 
that's why it's exciting when we learn about one of these good deeds, because oftentimes they do go, not that they go unnoticed, but they go, I think people like to hold these experiences close to their hearts. And so when we get to share in that and learn of these experiences, it just makes it that much better. It does. It makes everybody feel good. (laughs) <laughs> right. So I, I feel like I helped I, by the fishing pole and I don't even know the guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK, so you your full time job, you work in public relations type, you know, you work within the community. And I know that you recently actually, you know, speaking of fishing in the outdoors and all of that, you actually had an experience recently that kind of pertained to the outdoors. And I think you should share it. <laughs> Yeah, this is another one that really hit close to home for me. It, it just happened the other day, and I, well, let me just share. So I I do do some community relations and, and some public relation work in Summit County, Utah. And in Summit County, uh, which contains part of the Uinta Mountains, very vast, large uh, mountain range in in the Rocky Mountains, we get a lot of visitors who come in, not just from all parts of Utah, but from all areas of the country who come in to explore the, the mountains. And, and, uh, we, we see everything from Boy Scout groups to families to hunters in the fall. So in October of 2019, a West Virginia man by the name of Carl Crumrine came out to Utah with his friend to go hunting. Carl was a 69-year-old man and making a a first trip out here with his friend to hunt. And at the end of the first day, he did not return to camp. And so my friends with the local search and rescue department were called. They received that 911 call and they were asked to go into the mountains to help search for Carl. And I, I just paused to give a shout out to search and rescue organizations nationwide because the work that they do saves lives every single day they're the ones who go in who perform the scary missions they climb the steep terrain they go up mountains they go into avalanches to save those who got caught up in these treacherous conditions and so so huge salute to everyone these are volunteer-based organizations that you know these searchers they're not getting paid to be out there but they do it because Mm -hmm. they care And so last year in 2019, the local search and rescue department invited me to go with them and to kind of do a ride along, if you will, to go shadow them for a day. And it happened to be on this search for Carl Crumrine from West Virginia. And so I spent a day out there with the sheriff's office. I hung out with them. I watched the searchers and I kind of just learned what it's like to be a day in the life of a search like this. They've got a mobile command unit set up that they run out of the back of a mobile trailer. They've got a a full size motor home up there. And in this motor home, they've got all their computers hooked up, their equipment. They're running GPS trackers where every hunter, or not hunter, excuse me, but every searcher goes out and searches on foot while wearing a GPS. And when they come back to camp, they hand their search equipment over and the guy at the computer then inputs all of this information. So they actually have a computer model that shows a red footprint of everywhere that the searchers have been. So that helps them with their efforts to make sure that they're not just sending guys out, you know, there's a a method to the madness, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I learned all of that. And... So I I had this really, I I think, a privilege and an honor to take advantage of this opportunity to go hang out with our search and rescue team and and also to spend a little bit of time with Mr. Crumrine's family. They had flown out from West Virginia and they were there. And so I spent some time around the campfire visiting with his family members and 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 then my time at the search ended and so i left at the end of my day and i felt a renowned respect a renewed respect but a renowned respect for everybody who participates in this work and just wants to be able to help to find that person who's missing well fast forward um mr crumrine was not found last fall we we weren't able to find him our our searchers searched a million different ways by foot, by air, 
and um, took dogs in with them, hiked, uh, brought in some horses and did some searches that way, but they, they were unsuccessful. This October of 2020, the hunting season began, and on October 5th of 2020, Mr. Crumrine disappeared on October 14th. One year later and nine days shy of his one-year mark, one year from when he disappeared, a hunter stumbled across the remains of of a hiker, a hunter. And, mm-hmm. and they could tell that it was a hunter based on the the things that were there. That included his satchel, his bag that he was carrying. Even his gun was still there. Everything completely wow. intact, just the way that it was. So, so long story short, it was Mr. Crumrine. The, they, um, the searchers went back up there and they were able to bring him home in a respectful way and, um, to also get the medical examiner involved and to be able to confirm that it was Mr. Crumrine, but to also be able to bring closure to this family. And Mr. Crumrine's son publicly stated on Facebook that he can't think of a better way for his dad to have passed than to pass doing something that he loves and in one of the prettiest places in the world. And oh my gosh, that just got me when I read that. Uh, You know, here's this family who's been, had their world turned upside down for a year and just shy of the one year mark, they were able to find closure to bring their father home and and in his son's words to know that he died doing what he loved in one of the prettiest places in the world that's obviously like heartbreaking and i can't even imagine what it's like to be the family of somebody that goes missing how how hard that is but what an amazing perspective his son has to be able to you know give such respect to his father that's really amazing Yeah, I thought that was a beautiful tribute. So I wanted to share that with you today because October 28th, every year, October 28th is National First Responders Day. And first responders, of course, include our police officers, our firefighters. But as I had this experience to spend some time with our search and rescue team, I realized and reminded myself that first responders go well beyond our firefighters and our police officers We have searchers who are out on the mountain. We have dispatchers sitting in an office on the other side of the phone. We have people handling crisis lines, talking to someone who might be considering suicide. We have people out there every single day responding to your needs and to my needs. And October 28th is a day that we can pause, take a step back and pay tribute to everybody who is there to serve us in our time of need. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Something is that I think that sometimes with anybody that's in a like position of authority or whatever, sometimes it's easy to forget that they're people too and they have families that they go home to. And like you said, they are giving a lot for us. And as we move into t- today's guest, I'm super excited for the interview with her because I know what her career is, that she is a first responder, but she's a human too. And that's what makes me so excited that they're humans. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't think that we should wait any longer. This is the much anticipated, the much awaited for interview with Jessica Bloomberg. And this is a fantastic interview. I, of course, had have already talked with her and we're going to get to that here in just a second. But she is someone who you had had an experience with through quilting, you first connected with her over there. And 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 so we reached out to her. It's because of some amazing work that she is doing. So we're not going to delay any longer. We can't wait to introduce to our listeners and our viewers, Miss Jessica Bloomberg. She is a cop by day. She is a quilter by night. She loves to bake, she loves to garden, she has a green thumb, and today she is paying it forward one stitch at a time. Here's a look back at our conversation. Jessica, good morning, how are you doing? I'm good, Chriselle, how are you? Good, good. 
I want to dive right in and acknowledge that you are a police officer for the city of Stamford, Connecticut. You've been patrolling the streets and keeping people safe for 19 years. Are people minding their P's and Q's? They are. People stop us and ask us for masks. And there's some semblance of life getting back to normal. So it's a good combination. Sure, good, good. You see a little bit of everything when you're out there on the streets, I imagine. Yes. Uh, you don't get invited to that many birthday parties, let's put it that way. But um, yeah, you meet people under the most unusual, intimate, scary, and sometimes beautiful circumstances too, like the birth of babies and stuff like that. Sure. Well, I, I can imagine that this year has been a little bit different given the COVID-19 pandemic. Have you, has your police department gotten involved in doing any drive-by birthday parties or anything a little different because of the pandemic? We've done tons of drive-by birthday parties. They are so much fun to do for children and adults. But even more meaningful was, or most meaningful to me, was the 15th birthday party in July for a young lady who actually turned 15 in May, but was in the hospital with cancer. So she was cancer free in July. And her neighbor said, because she was in the hospital for her actual birthday, could we do a drive by? And members of her church, her neighborhood, and every person imaginable joined us for that. It was so good that we went round the block twice. The chief oh. just stood there, but it was awesome. Oh, awesome. Kudos to everybody in Stanford who participated in that. That's amazing. That's yeah, wonderful. it was nice. Well, we can't get too far into this interview without acknowledging your amazing accent. That's not just a Connecticut accent, is it? No, it comes from a little further south than Connecticut. I was born and raised in Cape Town, South Africa, in a place called Clifton Beach, which if you Google, you'll be left scratching your head wondering why am I in Connecticut? Because <laughs> it's a beautiful white sand beach. And I'm still wondering too what I'm doing here. Connecticut's a little colder than South Africa too. You got that right. <laughs> So you immigrated here with your family, uh, and, and you've told me you were 20 years old when your family came over to America, and that meant that you jumped right into college. So where did you land first? I went to school in Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana, home of the Hoosiers. The first year I was there, Bobby Knight led the basketball team to winning the NCAA, and it was total madness. <laughs> and but the total kind of madness that you want to get involved with and jump on board with. So I learned all about basketball. I learned about community togetherness. It was awesome. And you told me you learned a few things too when you arrived that have nothing to do with basketball, but uh, <laughs> you, you learned a few things that are true to Americans that you had never experienced in South Africa before. Okay, so crazy, like, well, firstly, I'd never seen snow before. So, uh, and it snows a fair amount in Indiana. I didn't have the correct clothes. I learned all about Land's End and L.L. Bean for the correct snowshoes and coats. I learned about waffles for breakfast. I'd never in the dorm, I'd never like, this was, but it was up my alley because I love sweets. And then this thing that I never tried, I'm not that courageous, country fried steak or chicken fried steak, I think it's called. <laughs> so I was never brave enough to try that, but. Have you tried Indiana it? Yeah, it was awesome. Have you have since tried country fried chicken? No, I think it's chicken fried steak, sorry. No, right. never have. Still haven't tried have. I, I think it's like deep fried battered steak. I, I don't know. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, it is? Oh yeah, I, I mean, it's the ultimate comfort food. I better get on board. It's full of calories too. Oh, well, you know. It, it's a great wintertime meal. So maybe maybe that's a goal that we can challenge you with for this winter. All right, uh, food goals I'm up for. Maybe with <laughs> mashed potatoes, gravy, that kind of thing. Sounds good. So I, I love this next part of your story. You needed to find somewhere to go for graduate school. 
And you went about finding your next location in a very unique way. My father's father was a lawyer. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. So um, I get a climate map of America because I suffered through snow, but I didn't like snow. So I get a climate map of America and I land up applying for law school in San Diego. I mean, the ultimate weather is there. And the climate map. Who else the pulls climate map. climate map to say, this is going to be how I choose where I'm going next? I know it doesn't really make sense, but you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure how to pick a school. I mean, there's so many schools in America. It's kind of overwhelming as a foreigner, but that was where I went. And then from San Diego, you got involved in what kind of work? Well, so I spent a year in law school and I didn't really like it that much. So I went to see a vocational psychologist who tested me and said, no, what you're thinking about is called social work in America. So when I was in school in Indiana, I'd heard Ryan White talk. He was a teenager who was infected with HIV through a blood transfusion. And I had been really struck by how ostracized he was. And HIV and AIDS was just starting. So yes, I get a map from the CDC of where there's the most HIV in America. And it's either San Francisco or New York City. And I applied to social work schools in both and got accepted at New York University. So I packed up and left San Diego and went back to snow. <laughs> no figure. And of course, used another map to get there. Yep. <laughs> so in New York, your work with the HIV community really took off. Yeah, I got a master's in social work from NYU. And my first job was at the Mount Sinai Medical Center, which is on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, but services a huge population from East Harlem. 21 social workers in the hospital, solely dedicated to people with HIV and AIDS, offering them care from the point of diagnosis to death and everything in between. And it was awesome. I mean, sad, but there's just something about standing alongside people when everybody else has abandoned them, uh, including oftentimes their families that just spoke to a, a deep part of me. And I, I can only imagine how rewarding that work must have been. Yeah. So uh, moving forward, we, we're getting up close to the year 2000 and you had started to interact a lot with police officers through this social work that you were doing. And you learned that there was some openings with Stanford Police Department. But first, in order to become a police officer, there's a few steps that need to be taken, including a little test. And you decided <laughs> yeah. to take that test, but I think that you weren't taking it serious. Not really, because just the idea of being a police officer was I didn't, I didn't, I don't have police officers in my family. And I kind of just took the test on a whim, you know, and um, people had said to me, the police officers I worked with at the time, because I changed to a different agency, they'd said, I don't know if you really cut out for this job or not, you know, you should maybe take the FBI test or whatever. But I landed up taking this test and um, I was the city's first hire <laughs> out of, I think there were 18 of us. They hired 18 off that test and I was the first hire. So, well, and you also I don't know. won on that test. Let's be clear. You were top of the class. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so scored top of the class, got a position with Stanford police department. And th this was August of 2000. Right. Less a year later, you found yourself in the police academy when September 11th happened. Yeah. happened on that day? How, what was going on for you? Well, we started class like normal. And like just before nine o'clock, they wheeled a television in and they said, pack up your stuff. And New York City is a 45 minute train ride away from Stanford. And I remember uh, vividly watching the World Trade Center, then the Pentagon and the field in Pennsylvania. 
and thinking um, what I what I get myself involved with. So they paired us up with veteran officers and sent us to different places in the city. I got sent to the train station because the thought at the time was that people would be leaving New York City en masse and it and they needed police there to guide people to whatever, provide services for whatever they needed. It turned out not that many people left the city for that reason, but obviously it was a huge day uh, for the country, the world, and you know us as uh, people in the recruits in the police academy too. Now let's let's move along and talk about that quill over your shoulder because I know that what you do can be very grueling, it can be intense, it can be mind numbing. And there comes a point when you just need to decompose and put all of the day behind you. So what do you do? How, when you come home, what do you do to turn that all off? Well, I have a garden. So, um, and I just built a vegetable garden this year. So next year in spring, I'm going to be going bananas, but I spend a lot of time in the garden. I knit, I learned how to quilt and I have rescue cats. I love to read anything to just drown out the griminess of the day. Sure. Uh, but fabric just, I mean, fabric is like my jam. You found it yourself a little bit at home when you were gifted a sewing machine and received some sewing lessons. And it yep. has blossomed into being a full-on quilt maker. You've made many quilts, too many to count, as I understand. Yeah, one of which I was lucky enough to have quilted by Natalia. Oh, wait, I have to take a moment to tell you. In the sewing world, quilting world, Natalia is a huge name. So I send this direct message to her asking, you know, will you quilt my quilt? And she agreed. And that's the quilt that's on my bed now to this day. She, her work is just, I mean, it's a treasure. It's unbelievably gorgeous. So yeah, fabric, making quilts, gifting quilts, keeping the occasional one just became like a huge hobby for me. Sure. And I, I know it can be even therapeutic to, to sit and work with the fabric and to come up with new patterns. In 2017, quilting took on a whole new meaning for you. What happened that year? So on July 5th, a police officer in New York City was sitting in like, um, sitting outside the precinct, but in a mobile office that they had. And she was shot point blank in the head, Mia Sotis. She was 35 years old when she was killed. The mother of an older child and two younger twins and just wiped out. And I, I told you how close New York City is. And I just remember thinking, I wanted to do something for this family. Um, New York City runs amazing funerals. Hundreds of thousands of people come for those funerals from all over the country and the world. But I just felt like I wanted to do something personally for those children. And that's this quilt. I had led a block swap and unbeknownst to me, some women went behind the scenes and sent me um, these blue blocks. So I put them together. It was quilted by um, Oli and Evie, Rhonda is her name. And I had told people, I wanna get this quilt to this family. I, I just felt like you wanna do something because I think that's what most quilt makers want to do. Yeah, so this quilt came together very quickly and you had the support of a few friends. After working on this first quilt, you had the idea to maybe do a couple more, ask for a couple of donations. And and I and you told me, you thought maybe you would get enough material and supplies to help make four or five more quilts. But what happened? It's still, it's, do you hear me like stumbling, mumbling? Because it's still hard uh, three years later to digest how putting one or two posts out on Instagram just takes this turn and speaks to literally thousands of people. In the basement downstairs, there are over a hundred quilts ready to be quilted. Yeah, people sent individual blocks, guilds sent completed quilts, people sent 
batting, binding, fabric, thread. People sent money to cover the postage. 100 um, quilts. Over. No, over 100. Over, over 100. 100. Where is this all coming from? All over the world. Canada, almost every state in the United States, Mexico, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, England, Ireland, uh, Sweden, France, Holland, Germany. That's, I, I just, I would just, my poor, not my poor, the letter carrier's grandmother used to quilt. So he was overwhelmed. I kept <laughs> leaving him like gift cards for Dunkin' Donuts out back. If he was home, if I was home when he was delivering, I'd show him what, and he was just blown away. I mean, stuff's still coming in to this day. And not just your letter carrier, but the ladies at the Stanford uh, uh, post office as well, correct? Yep. Yeah, because every time I'd go mail out a completed quilt to be gifted or the bits and pieces to make up a quilt, they were, you know, I've known them for 20 years. What are you mailing? Who's it going to? And I start to tell them the story and show them the pictures. And this week on Monday, I mailed out three and the women are like, where are these going? Who were the officers? God bless. And you just hope that means that things get to their destination safer with their blessing, you know? So I know that we have many people watching, many people listening who would like to join this effort because unfortunately we continue to lose officers in the line of duty every day. So yep. what can someone who's watching or listening do to contribute to this cause? Well, if you're on Instagram, the easiest way to see the whole evolution of this project is to look at the hashtag, which is blue RK blocks, because the block is called a raspberry kiss block. So I put that hashtag down and you can see this first quilt and you can see every quilt that's been done, every donation, every quilt that's been gifted. Um, the easiest way to reach me is by direct message on Instagram. So my profile is private because I'm a police officer, but I accept friend requests all the time. And just let me know how you want to help, um, how you see yourself being a part of this. Because the bottom line is I had this little idea. I never expected it to blossom. And it grew beyond my wildest dreams. And it's all because of so many generous hearts and hands, truthfully. I mean, it's social media put to good use, yeah. 100%. I've, I've taken some time to scroll through that hashtag. So again, it's blue arcade blocks. And what I noticed is that people get involved one at a time as individual quilters, but you also have people who are teaming up with all of their friends in their guild and you have guilds working on an entire quilt and sending it to you. And, and you take all of the above, you'll take full quilts, you'll take the blocks because it all helps, right? Absolutely, everything from A to Z, from like even one block, because my, my um, saying was, no, I'll leave no block behind. It takes 42 blocks to make a quilt and if I have two blocks left I'll make or I have friends who said just let me know and I'll make the other 42 so that when we call this a day whenever that may be there'll be no blocks left behind and everything will be done perfectly and gifted to families so yep we're all banding together and making these quilts that these families appreciate I know. So I want to ask you 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 have now gifted several quilts do you have some stories, maybe one or two that have resonated or, or touched you in a certain way? The way that we gift the quilts is the hardest part of the whole story because I'm kind of adamant that the, the quilts be gifted in person. So if, for example, you knew, uh, let's say your aunt knew somebody who, who knew a family who lost a police officer, that's how we would get the quilt to them. I don't like to mail the quilts to people. I think that's creepy. I don't like to mail them to police departments because they probably sit in the mail room. But I did mail one to the family of Jordan Corder. Um, after his mother 
sent in blocks herself. And she sent me a note about her son who was killed in the line of duty saying, people say they will never forget, people forget. And what resonated with me is if an officer is killed in June, we don't have to get them the quilt in July. A year later, two years later, five years later, whenever the time's right, because like Diane said, people forget this quilt and gifting them the quilt is a way of showing them we haven't forgotten. And that was how the quarters got their quilt. I, they travel all around America. I only knew her through her sending me a quilt, uh, blocks for a quilt. I tracked her down. And on the third anniversary of their son being killed in the line of duty, they opened a package that had a quilt. And it's all over the hashtag. It's, uh, it just touched me in a place that it's hard to put, put it into words, but it means a great deal to this family. I know that. Absolutely a great reminder. And I know that, you know, from the own loss I've experienced in my life and talking with those who have experienced loss, they, one thing I heard over and over was that the first year is tough, of course, but what I heard repeatedly was the second year is worse. And that is because in the first year, people do remember it's fresh, it's raw. People check in, they ask you how you're doing. Year two rolls around and people kind of take a step back. Time has moved on. But for those who are grieving, grief doesn't go away. Grief can change and it can look different. Yep. In fact, I am going to be gifting a quilt in person to the family of a Stanford police officer who was killed in the 60s. Um, I'm waiting for, he, he was killed and he left three children behind, one of whom I knew as a social worker. So I'm waiting for all three of them to come together. Corona's put uh, a little damper on that, but it doesn't matter. It's the fact that this many years later, we still recognize that they grew up without a father because he was killed in the line of duty at work. And we respect the sacrifice they made and want them to know we'll never forget. Yeah. There was another quilt that you gave to the family of a fallen officer. And, and I believe at that time, his wife was pregnant. Correct. Kyle Padgley from the Berks County Sheriff's Office in uh, Berks County, Pennsylvania. He was a canine officer. So I roped one of our canine officers into coming with me to Pennsylvania. And uh, Officer Pavia and I took, he had at the time two canines with him. We took them to Pennsylvania with us and gifted his then five-year-old daughter who had never met her father, a quilt. And um, it was just amazing. I. When, when people gift quilts now, I leave them my cell phone number and say call because uh, I was nervous gifting the quilt. You know, you're meeting complete strangers. It's a very uh, personal moment for them, intimate moment, and you don't want it to be awkward. So I was worried about it being awkward. It was not awkward at all. They were warm and lovely people and the sheriff was a very generous man. He came in on his day off and facilitated this whole thing. And to meet Savannah and her mother was just amazing. And to hear that to this day, she still loves her quilt. It's all over her bed most of the time. It's just amazing. What What did she say to you after you left? You got a text when you were driving home. Yeah, we. Um, so Officer Pavia and I were driving home and we get a, I get a text from Alicia, her mom. And it's a picture of her on her bed, hugging the quilt. And she said, Savannah said, how did they know my dad? And Alicia told her, your father was a hero. All police officers know heroes. And I uh, read this to Officer Pavia, who's driving, and I lose it. Mm -hmm. And this is a big burly man with, you know, two canines. And he swears to this day that it was the dogs in the back that were crying and not him. But you I'm know. not crying, you're crying. Exactly, and I was crying. I just, you know, it's just to be invited in 
to these people's lives and to show them that we appreciate the sacrifice their families made and that we never forget. I know I keep saying it, but it's true. Uh, we don't ever forget. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great line. Uh, all police officers are heroes. But I do want to acknowledge the amazing contribution that you are doing to pay it forward to our first responders. I, I know you said you've also recently gifted a first quilt to a firefighter. So for everyone, Correct. everyone listening, if you know of a family who could benefit from one of these quilts, please go to Instagram right now and send a direct message to Crafty Cop. In the meantime, check out hashtag blue RK blocks to see the wonderful work that is being done. Jessica, thank you so much for being here today. It has been wonderful to catch up and to find out how things are going in Stanford. Thank you. I really appreciate the fact that you and Natalia are interested in how social media has been put to good use. That's, that's the takeaway for me. I appreciate it, Chrisha. Oh my gosh, I just have to say, I loved that interview. So obviously, like we talked about, I've known Jessica for years, but only really known her as a quilter. And I knew that she was a cop. That's all I really knew about. And I knew what she was doing, paying it forward and how amazing what she's doing is. But I had no idea anything else. And all I have to say is she's freaking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> she is amazing and she's way too humble about everything. She does not give herself enough credit for what she is doing. But Natalia, one yeah. thing that I learned while talking with Jessica off camera is that the quilt that she sleeps under on her bed is a quilt that you machine quilted for her. And I know that you've machine quilted for many, many people. But I have to tell you, after meeting her and talking with her, she, in fact, she began the conversation with me by saying, Chriselle, hold on. I just need to interrupt. I just need you to know that I'm not a very good quilter. I've, I've only been doing this for a few years. I consider myself a newbie to the business. But Natalia, Natalia is an expert in this field. Natalia is someone who is a name to be noticed and to know every single day when I walk into my room and I see that quilt that Natalia Bonner quilted on my bed, I can't believe it. I cannot believe I was lucky enough that she would be willing to quilt for me. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you, Jessica. I I love that quilt still. It's still one of the favorite ones. That, lots of them are favorites, but that is definitely still a favorite. And Sometimes I still pinch myself that this is my job. It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today and being here, uh, giving us some of your time. We love to spend an hour with you each week. Don't forget to go back and to listen to some of our other podcasts. If you're just catching up, they're all on YouTube. And of course, your favorite podcast streaming device. Have a great week. See you later, everybody.